Just so I know who I'm talking to, how many people of you really feel like you're engaged in video already uh, at the dealership? So, about 10%. So, when Jim first called me, the first thing out of his mouth was the title to this. The chances are your video sucks. He loved it. I thought it was good too. Um, I was thinking about it on the way here, and I kind of added the bottom addendum because the truth is, for most people, chances are your videos are actually just pictures. Um, and a lot of people think that customers can't tell the difference. Let me show something here. But the key to video is that there's a message behind the video. It's not just moving pictures. Um, you know, th this is something that you're going to find typically on about 80% of video vendors, or I'm sorry, dealers that raise their hand that they are video dealers are going to actually have a presentation that's a lot more like this. So uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse on here, but I'm trying to hover over this three views, which I think is important. So uh, before today, pretty much every time you guys have heard somebody talk about video, it's been for the purposes of SEO. Uh, video has always been used to drive traffic to a site, to direct traffic to one site, to engage people here or there. Um, I've never seen it that way. <clears throat> so most of the graphs justifying video have looked like that. If you have 5,000 hits, the goal is to get 8,000 hits. If you have 8,000 hits, the goal is to get 10,000 hits, and it's an upward race. So this presentation in particular, and video will accomplish a lot of those things, is not about that. Um, most of you guys have already got enough traffic on your website to sell plenty, plenty of vehicles. Um, so this is more about how to close the traffic that you already have uh, and not necessarily gain more of it. So my goal is today, uh, convince you guys that the time for doing videos is literally right now. Um, it's going to be this year and like anything else, uh, you know, the first, the first soda makers were Pepsi and Coke and, uh, and that's why they're still around. And you'll find anyone who beats everyone else to market, especially in your area, is going to see a similar effect. You're already kind of out ahead of everybody as far as content and you're already kind of getting down some of the best practices. Um, so I help you understand how Google rates its SEO, which I think there's a lot of stuff that gets talked about with how Google works and, and all that, but it's really a pretty simple equation. There's not a lot of magic to it, in my opinion. Um, so the other one is how to get your videos out for free to your prospects. I think a lot of you guys that have talked to people about doing video for your dealers, it's people who already have distribution companies. And the bulk of their revenue and the bulk of their profit comes from helping you distribute the videos to the customers and not necessarily help you create great ideas and great content that the customers will come and interact with on their own. Um, the fourth one is how to capture good, reliable footage at the dealership. So I'll preface this with a lot of stuff that you can make at a dealership is going to require some editing. Uh, so another one of my goals is, is to convince you guys that having somebody in-house that knows video should be a standard place as having somebody in-house that knows how to detail cars. You know, it's really not what, de what car lots do, but it's, it's part of the process. And, and having somebody coming in, taking your pictures that you know, three, four days at a time goes by and missing all those testimonials, it, it doesn't make sense for the price point that most dealerships can install a good video guy in there and do at least basic editing on a lot of this stuff. So what I'm going to try to teach you is how to produce quality, reliable footage that looks good, sounds good, and is, is, is something that you can put and mix together and get something really, really nice. Um, and the last one is the seven effective types of video. So, and this is kind of touching on what I said before. There's a lot of different ways you can use video, and it's not always just a music video or a video. There, there's a lot of different specific uses for the video, and understanding those uses and the different types that you can apply is, uh, is at least half the battle. So how I got into this, uh, I've, I've been a car background, I used to do uh, super sales for years and years, and uh, I've been to tons and tons of dealerships, and the one thing that always shocked me was uh, the tra no one was really trying to do any, any real conversion of that traffic. I mean, everybody had meetings about how, what happened on the lot, and you missed this guy, did you call him back? But literally, almost every one of them had thousands of opportunities online, and, and literally did nothing with any of them, and nobody seemed upset by it. So that's where we kind of started off seeing our niche. And with everybody being so focused on driving traffic to the lot, um, I don't know how many of you guys are from states that have blue laws, uh, where you, know, you, you can't have a dealership open on a Sunday. And if you go there on a Sunday, if you forgot your keys or you went back to the building, you'd be mortified because the entire lot's full of people. There's people everywhere on Sunday because they know there's no salespeople there, but how many of those cars get sold on a Sunday? So driving traffic to a lot, or to a, oh, I'm sorry, a website with no presentation is not terribly dissimilar to driving traffic to a lot that's closed. Uh, you're not going to sell any cars, which is where the old adage, the internet doesn't sell cars, came from, because it doesn't do it for you. So uh, why does everyone have the same presentation online? It's kind of a good question. Uh, big dealers, little dealers, they separate themselves based on their, their merchandising, their product presentation on the lot. Um, but if you go online as a consumer and you don't know those things, the only thing you know is what you're being shown online, and that's pictures of cars. They're all the same. Whether you're a big dealer or a little dealer, there's really no difference between the way uh, a really top-notch dealer will present his cars 
and it may be a bottom tier dealer. Now, if you're on that dealership's lot, salespeople would be tidier, they'd be, you know, everything about their presentation would be better, it's how they got to where they are, but if it's, it's clearly not being conveyed online. Um, and the last bit is just an obvious fact. If pictures sold cars, if cars sold themselves, then our loss would just be full of pictures of cars. We would never need any salespeople at all. So obviously that would not work. Um, so one of the other things I'd like to point out, managers spend just about half of their day battling new car salespeople or newish car salespeople to <clears throat> kind of take away the logic of what that salesperson thinks their customer is telling them and just bring them inside. Because once they're inside, we can expose them to our process. If they don't like the color of the car, we can still probably sell it. If they don't like the price, we can probably work on that. And all the, over, all the variables that are there as a desk guy and as people who have been in the business for a long time, we understand that that is actually what we do is overcome that. The new person hears what they hear, and we spend half our time battling them. So this is always something I thought was funny here. Perspective of a brand new salesperson. Uh, is it pretty much always that if a price was lower, you're more likely to make the sale? I don't know how many of you guys remember your first week, but that seemed like it was a one-to-one -one equation. If I lower the price, i am be a little bit more likely to get the deal. And you learn over time that's not always the case. The second one is that the customer always knows exactly what they want. I mean, how many times do we come back inside, no boss, they want a blue one? Well, you know, after, over time of being in the business, we understand what to do with that sort of objection. In the beginning, it seems like the golden rule. Um, and these are, the, these are the ones that are the bane of most, most desk guys' existence. So this, the third one is that it's all about the car. Uh, there's a million ways, that, trust me, from doing staffed events to get somebody to buy a car. And it's not always about the car. It very often has nothing to do with the car. So, and none of these are true. So what I think is funny about, sorry, sorry, touching the mic. What I think is funny about this is that if you look at the perspective of a desk guy, your, your, your top-notch 30-year guy that knows everything about the working deals on the internet, the first thing he thinks is, if you lower the price, you're more likely to earn the business. The customer already knows what they want. There's nothing you can really do to change it, and it's all about the car, which is hilarious to me, because that same guy is, is like this, with his new guys all day, battling those same problems. So this is a, an adage that I think is pretty obvious. There, there is, however, one thing that will never change in our business, and that is if you do not slow the customer down, build value in yourself, your store, your methods, your vehicles. If you ever do sell the vehicle, it will not be a very profitable sale for your company. And I think that's obvious whether you're standing on a lot or whether you're on the internet. It shouldn't change. So I think good managers realize that uh, what they really do for a living is, is build more value. You, know, you take a sales guy, you get him to be more confident. You take a confident sales guy, you get him to be a manager. You take a customer, get him to do a test drive. You take a test drive, get a write-up. You get a write-up, you get a finance bump. Whatever we do, we add value to what it is that we do. Online, that process is completely removed. We get an opportunity, we hope it buys, we act like new guys. So what, what I, when I get into the video element of what, what I want to talk about today, I want you guys to keep in mind that what I'm premising is just returning to the basics. It's the exact same things that every old school car guy would be comfortable with. It's just figuring out a way to take that message, compress it into video, and get it out there where people are digesting this stuff every day. So, in tune with that, building, a, a, bu building one, I, that's a funny thing too, Jim said, uh, your parents are your video sucks, he typed that. And I think that's funny because video just kind of shows where everybody's head is. Like you're gonna do a good video and then his video will be better. Uh, and I think everybody realizes it's more about sort of swamping everybody with videos. I hate the word swamp because I think you, sh you should really only need about 30 pieces of content to really make the case of what your dealership is no matter how they're broken out. Uh, beyond that, I think you, you kind of are just swamping people. But the trick is not to have a really sweet video or to have this video be better than that video. It's to have a package of video that would explain your process just like you have a package of closes to bring somebody in and build value in your store. So this is my, uh, and I, this is my first battle plan. So I'm sure you guys have heard way more intellectual breakdowns of how Google works than, uh, than this. But uh, essentially, Google is a very simple enterprise. All they're looking to do is connect the person who's typing something into the keyword search into the thing that they're going to play with once, they start, once it pops up. That's it. Uh, you know, in the auto industry, it looks a little different to us because we can buy keywords and we can track this and that. So it seems like they're catering to us because you, have a, you, know, you know a Google rep. At the end of the day, the only thing they care about is if somebody types in 2008 Volkswagen Jetta, the eight listings that they popped up, do those people interact with those listings? Do they stay? Do they like it? And that's the only thing that Google cares about. At the end of the day, no matter how many times they rework their search engine, it'll always be for that goal to find the thing that the person searched for wanted to interact with. It'll never be anything else other than that. And if you don't try to cheat Google, if you don't try to work in the back door, if you just build non-sales oriented content for your customers, they will find it, they will use it, and Google already knows they did it. And you don't have to interact with Google at all. So it's just about interacting with your customers the same way it'd be on a lot. Google's just gonna tell everyone that you do that well, or don't do that well. 
So <clears throat> before I get into the seven types that you can do of video messaging, I wanted to compare two different types of, of advertising that I think a lot of people don't take the time to really draw a distinction between. So there's passive branding, which is newspaper ads. I put it up in the top left corner. I'm from Indiana. Uh, beep, beep, it's Girly Leap. I don't know if you, how many of you guys know that. But uh, it was a jingle when I was a kid. I don't know that I ever bought a car from them, but I'll never not remember that song. Beep, beep, it's Girly Leap. It drives me nuts to this day, and I can't forget it. That's passive branding. And it might not say, this is why to come buy a car right now, but if I was out driving around, I'll never forget about Curly Leap. So aggressive branding is Sunday, Sunday, Sunday sort of sales. This is right now, these are the sort of things that most dealers are much more interested in. When I started off doing video and pitching it to dealers, we started off pitching it as a passive branding effort. This is how to get your brand out there. This is how to put yourself online at no cost, expose people to your brand image for years and years and years. And people didn't want to hear that. It was, it was as, as much sense as it made that, that it wasn't in the line with what they were already thinking. What they were thinking was, I have an advertising budget that I use to drive traffic. So if you can show me how to throw that at video and make the phone ring, I'm all in. So we kind of revamped what we do to, uh, to fit that. And so we kind of drew the distinction between what is aggressive branding and what is, what is passive branding. The good thing is I start to break down some of these different types of video messages you can make, and I have examples for some of them. Um, is that you can sort of combine these two to get a little bit of passive and a little bit aggressive out of it. Uh, no video effort's gonna be the same thing as doing a direct mail piece. But obviously you can drive quite a bit of traffic. I'll show you how to get these in front of people who are buying that week, which is really where the difference is made. So uh, this is just a little addendum here. The best part of web message, this didn't go anywhere else in, the, in my little packet here, but it should be said. So the best part of web messages that a lot of people don't realize is that they don't have to be 30 seconds. The reason every car commercial sounds the same is because they're all 30 seconds. And the last is information about the dealer, they premise the idea, you've got about 10 seconds to draw a comparison between yourself and another dealership, and it's not enough time. So the beauty of being online, um, you know, there's obviously restrictions. You don't want people to not finish your video, so there's a, a time length restriction on how long they can be, but normally it's two or three minutes. In two or three minutes, you can make, that's a whole commercial break. You can make a much better case for whatever it is that you're trying to sell, and it's free uh, as compared to paying for it on TV. So, um, so same thing I was saying before, not only that, but you can also combine, uh, <coughs> combine messages to, uh, to make one ultimate point. So I'm gonna get into the messages real quick that we use to make these videos, but I wanna point out, first of all, I still to this day tell our clients that we are a message company. I correct them every time they call us a video company. And I think it's important to draw that distinction when you're, when you're talking to a video vendor yourself or whether you're looking at doing it in-house to see yourself as what messages do I wanna put out to the customers using video and not what videos can I create. Um, you know, a lot of our clients, the first day is, is always a joke because we walk around and everything they're excited about, they just point, oh, he's got a new coffee machine, we should do a video about that. It's like, eh, you know, I'm in, you know, but where are we going to put that video? And, and that's kind of the point. You, you break down who am I trying to attract with this, where will they interact with it at, and what format should it look like when it gets there. Some of our videos are designed to be three and a half minutes because they're designed for a website. Some of our, some of our videos are designed to be 30 seconds because they're designed for a microsite. So a lot of this, and that's where breaking down these types of messaging is important because when you realize what types of video messaging there are, it makes it a lot easier to sneak them into all the different places. So the first one's obvious, testimonials. The second one is uh, employee bios, lead response, which this is sort of like uh, Elise Capart's AO, and I'm sure you guys have been, been hit with stats at these events before for the type of retention and, and really phenomenal stats compared to responding without video uh, that come to responding with it. The third one is, is, is huge, um, department statements. This is service department, used car department, new car department. And I'm gonna show you examples of all these in a minute. Uh, the fourth one is brand statements. Departments are uh, every department in your dealership, so that's not gonna change. If you're, if you're heavily involved in special finance, I would add that to, to service uh, new and used. Brand statements are uh, a little different. And brand statements aren't really designed, they go on your website. They're not really designed to be the main place that somebody interacts with them at. Brand statements are to go out with your vehicles. And I'll show you how here in a minute. Uh, but brand statements are things like, I'm a Volkswagen dealer. Um, I know TDI better than anybody in my market. Um, I sell a lot of used cars. I've invested more in my detail process than anybody else in my market. And if you look at a car for me, it's gonna be a clean car. Uh, it could be, I know Mustangs. Uh, if you're looking at buying a muscle car, don't buy it from somebody that doesn't know how they work. Folks, we drive them, we own them, we have them on the lot, we stock more than anybody. So it's, it's really whatever you could have as a niche value. Kind of, he, um, he touched on it earlier with Pinterest. It's really about analyzing who your market is and what your brand is. 
And this is just another way of helping identify with people as to what your particular brand is. And then the fifth one is product features. Product features are sort of obvious, um, but they are sort of a gray area as well if you don't do them right, because product features typically aren't going to tell somebody why to buy that product from you. A lot of the, the leased or loaned video that a lot of dealers have on their websites today are actually product statements that are sort of borrowed from corporate or borrowed from somebody else. And that's great to have video content for SEO purposes, don't get me wrong. Um, like I said, I don't look at it that way. I look at video as a closing tool, and that doesn't tell somebody why to buy from you unless you do it the right way, which is a gray area. It pretty much just means putting it up there with videos alongside other videos that are only about you. Uh, the sixth one is event and charity videos. Um, you know, it's, it's extremely cheap to either have somebody in-house or to have a local video vendor. I know tons of dealers that spend two, $3,000 invested in a Little League to help the Little League. For an extra $600, you can have half of that Little League on camera thanking you for it. It's kind of ridiculous to have spent $3,000 for a thank you that lasts 10 minutes when you could spend $3,600 on a thank you that lasts three years. So, well, yeah, it, it's, it's really whatever. I mean, if they sponsor, and I got an example here of a golf charity that was sponsored. But the point is, if you're going to write a check, uh, it's kind of like poker. You know, you're pot committed at a certain point. A certain percentage of what you're willing to invest in charitable efforts should be invested in sort of the reason a business does charitable efforts. I mean, it's nice to pick a charity and help, but you want everyone to find out that you did help as part, as part of your community outreach program. If you're not putting the video out there, if you're not actually making something that's going to last out of that event beyond just opening day or the golf events day, then it's just not really the outreach part that's being accomplished. It's, just some, it's not really community outreach at all. It's just throwing money away in a sense. I mean, it's great to be charitable. Don't, don't blame me as the bad guy. But it's much, much better to have those people. And I'll, I'll get, I'll, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I only got an hour. I, I'm coming back to that, Jim. I'll be there. So testimonials. Uh, testimonials should be specific. Search for things that are specific about each uh, situation to make your videos ready-made for effective topic-specific SEO. So that's a lot of $5 words in there. But basically what that means is uh, that's a good way to put out a lot of video, testimonials. Nobody will ever get sick of that. What's great about testimonials is if you ask them specifically what they bought, where they're from, if they have dogs, does a kid go to the high school, and I'll give you a, a, a list of things to ask them here in a minute. What that does is it allows you to really peg the keywords with a lot of individual things so that when people are out there looking around for video, these sort of crawlers go out there and these, these videos sort of feed back to your other video series because they're finding you on YouTube, they're finding your channel. So these are great ways to put a ton of keywords out in the market without doing sort of black hat SEO and just blasting keywords. You're actually providing real content for that. So if you're from Dwajak and you're citing Dwajak buyer, you're going to get a testimonial from a Dwajak buyer and it just adds to the validity of the whole process. So the first one is ask the right questions and get affirmations. Um, what I mean by that is when we first started, I do a lot of like, so did you, you had fun today? Yeah, yeah. So did you really like the car? Yeah. Like, oh. So you know, it's about learning how to phrase things when you're doing testimonies. We'll talk about your experience. What did it feel like? What, did you, what were you thinking when you came in? Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, and, and it sounds ridiculous, but as I go into how to make these sizzle later, it really is an important thing to get people speaking in two or three sentence chunks. And you'd be amazed how asking the question in a different way will get you a completely different response. Um, so use sort of some of audio, whether it's a lav mic, have some sort of audio uh, so that you hear the customer well. Another, another thing that basically no dealer is doing, a $150 investment can put you into having audio on somebody. A uh, $600 investment can put you into having one of these on somebody. Um, it's, it's worth the money in the long run. Um, get additional footage from the customer's buying experience. On our website uh, after this is going to be something that everyone can download that actually says these are the questions to ask your testimonial so that you're going to get a good narrative of, of what their day was like. And these are some shots to get to help glue those bits together so that when you edit them, uh, I don't want to get overly complicated here, but so that when you kind of smash them together, if I'm talking and then you smash to another bit and on move, it kind of throws people out of it. If I'm talking and you smash together something to edit it for content and then you kind of put a piece of footage over it, I'm going to show you here in a minute, uh, it, goes, it goes a long, long way. Because people don't realize you cut it. They think somebody just stepped up there and hit a perfect minute and a half testimonial and they're out of there. Um, so getting a truly great testimonial of a customer is, is really one of the best things you can do. Nobody will ever believe you the way they'll believe a, a fellow customer. Not to mention that these people commonly take these straight to Pinterest, Facebook, otherwise, and share it with their friends and show them how excited they are that they got a new car. So I'm sure you guys have all told people about the phenomenon of when somebody buys and their friends buy. There's no better way to access that pool of revenue than, than through doing a testimonial video with the customer. So I don't know if I have, see how we're doing on time here. 
I'm going to blow, blow through this one here a little bit. This is part of what's available on our website. These are just sort of some of the questions that you can ask. The point in doing this is that rather than saying how was your experience, and nobody's going to talk in three-act structure and give you a really great narrative, uh, you, if you ask these questions, you will force the narrative out of somebody to tell you, this is how I got here. This is what made up my mind. This was my salesperson's experience. This is what made me pick out the car. I had a great time. The numbers were easy. I would definitely recommend this to a friend. See ya. And you'll never get that unless you, unless you, you ask them the questions that draw it out of them, or unless they're an actor. Um, so employee, employee bios, uh, lead response. Um, I don't have a video for this, but I do have, uh, an, this has pretty much been pegged by Elise, I'm sure, if you guys have been here before. Uh, I'll throw some quick stats at you. What this is about is coming up with a, a series of bios for all the people in your department. Have one person talk about another person, have a manager talk about everybody, give some testimonials about these people. Maybe not everybody in your dealership, but the people who are interacting with your internet leads, uh, this is probably some of the best money you can spend in the house. It really, really, really is. Um, to, to have somebody put out a lead for a car and get back an automated response video that says, I'm going to call you back shortly. It, uh, it, it's, it's doubling the retention rate on, on, on actually following through and having stickativity with, with internet opportunities. So third is department statements. Uh, department statements are made by the manager of each individual department. They address what the managers and or feel like are the concerns of the customers in the individual departments. Now that's just the way I style ours. I guess you could do these anyways, but I think that's the brilliant way to do it because you're telling the consumer, these are what I've recognized are your concerns, and these are how I've, this is how I've set my apartment up around addressing those concerns so that you don't have them. I mean, that, that's what customers are searching for online. Why do you stop at six sites if they all have pictures that are the same? That, that is what they're looking for, is that, that affirmation. So these, these videos show the customer three things, your staff, your store, and hopefully what to expect out of their next buying experience. So it doesn't sound like a big deal, but you'd be amazed how just having somebody see the inside of your store, see your finance guy, see your new car manager, there is a small chance that they might not like him. But there's thousands of opportunities. And if you can put a video out there that makes somebody not like you, then there'll be somebody out there that does, and that's a car deal. So I'm going to play just a quick example of a department statement that we did for uh, McDonald Volkswagen. Oh. The Volkswagen shopper is really unique to uh, car buyers. They're looking for a great sense of value. At the same time, they want to get German styling, German engineering, safety, and performance in their vehicles. The Volkswagen is the perfect package for all of those things to come true. And we try to take a lot of the things that customers have identified for us as difficult out of the process. So we have a one price strategy on all of our new cars. We present that price to the customer. It's our advertised price. It's our internet price. Customers communicate with sales managers virtually from the time they walk in the door and take a lot of what typically aggravates customers out of the equation. So it's about small margins, lots of cars. I, I love McDonald's. I honestly do. I can honestly say that. So in the I interest of time, I think you guys kind of get where that's going. Um, everybody. I like to try to put as many testimonials as possible in brand statements. Um, brand statements are kind of broad. You're making a lot of claims in a short period of time. So anytime you can say something and then have that directly backed up by a customer, it's going to go a lot further than just having managers stand up there saying, trust me. Uh, and that's something that I don't typically do for brand statements. Um, so same thing with brand statements. You kind of went over this before. The one thing I do want to point out here is there are literally over 100 types of rum in the world. Um, and they, they all stay in business. They're not going to go out of business next year because they all have very unique properties and they do a great job of identifying what it is that's unique about their particular brand. Um, you know, there's the same thing in the car industry. You, you have to identify what you offer. Are you a spice rum? Are you cheap? Are, are, you, are you the most value after the sale? Are you the place to get one pricing if you don't like negotiating? You know, what is your niche? And, and I think before you can start really going after having a brand image online, you have to be able to at least answer those questions. And these are what help identify that you have answered those questions for consumers and help you kind of attach to a certain section of, of your market. So this is a quick example. Hello, my name is Jack Roten. I'm the general sales manager from the same dealership. Volkswagen. We understand well, when it comes to pre-owned vehicles, our customers' expectations of that car is just as clean and reliable as a new car. 
This is one so we recommend putting, and I'm going to show you how to distribute these later. This is, this is for an auto trader. Um, so what this is is about their detail process. Now put yourself in the position of a, of a, a pre-owned buyer, um, especially a Volkswagen pre-owned buyer. They're not your special finance get me done customer. They're looking for a premium vehicle. Uh, to see where the vehicle goes and to see who works on the vehicle and to, and to hear them talk about their own detailed standards is obviously going to make you feel more confident about the quality of a car that you get from them than a picture. So uh, product features. Product features are videos made up using the people at your store or a spokesperson to give the best demonstration of the products that you sell. Uh, this one's obvious. Uh, it's not as good as doing a walk around on the lot where you can ask somebody to come right inside, but if you've set your store up to literally be a process that processes an internet opportunity and turns it into an appointment, then this is a very valuable part of that puzzle. Uh, if you can put somebody on your product while you have them on your site, show them all the reasons to buy from your store, show them a history video about your dealership, I mean, you, you've done everything but ask for their business. Um, and at the quote at the bottom, to build as much value as possible in your products before the customer begins considering what they're worth. I think that's an important thing to point out. It, it's, it's no wonder that uh, we had the true car scare where everybody's knees shook for, for six months because that's what happens if you don't build value in your product and you sell it anyways. If you're not there to tell somebody what you offer above and beyond the price, then the only thing that will ever get compared will be the price. Um, so this is a huge way of showing your customers through perception that you have the right ideas, you have the right, I mean, obviously you must be selling more cars if their presentation is better, right? I mean, that's how customers will think. If, if you're the only one there and you're, you're there in spades, there must be a reason. You must be the better dealership. It's, just, it's the same thing as having a 19-foot gorilla outside. So this is a quick example of a product, uh, a product series that's a walk-around series. We actually syndicate these for all franchises, but it doesn't have to be something this sophisticated. I mean, keep it under five minutes. Make sure that you're, you're editing out the parts that don't work. Um, and, and, you know, you could even do these sorts of things in-house. Ford is really um, ahead of the curve now. Like, the first thing is that they just get surprised that it's even offered on a Ford product, because usually those are options that you actually get in the Lexus or on a Mercedes vehicle. How it works is like this. Let's say you want to find out a parking spot. You push the, the P button in the middle of the vehicle, right? And the sensors in the front end of the car are going to search for a space that's big enough for the vehicle to fit in there. It's going to ask you to pull up evenly with the next vehicle. The screen is going to prompt you to let you know to take your hands off the wheel, okay? And when you put it on reverse, the wheel will actually do the action, move, like movements, in which it will take the vehicle backwards and park it into the space for you. Oh, customers are loving it, especially here in downtown Seattle. You know, it makes it a lot easier to be able to maneuver the vehicle in downtown. Plus, pre just the people like me, there's a lot of us out there that parlor parking is really not that easy to do. You know, it's complicated. The depth percentage is not quite there, so it helps you out pretty well. I think that's fantastic. Unbelievable. I mean, that does a lot better job than I do. <laughs> um... But anyways, yeah, you, the, 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 car, the car essentially parks itself. That's the, that's the gig. And uh, they literally sold like 12 escapes off of that video right away. Right away. Um, because people came in and did not realize that it did that and wanted to take a test drive. And uh, car guys know that you don't always have to have somebody decide to buy the car. You can get them in to take a test drive. That is really what we do is, is, is follow the process. So they literally got an extra allocation for putting a bunch of uh, product-related videos out there. Uh, but they literally put, put cars on the ground with this and the hybrid video that they did immediately after because they got calls about it. Um, and that doesn't work in Seattle anymore. You gotta, everybody's got video there now. So uh, this is an example of a, of a charity video. It's kind of a, a, a golf video that we had done. And this is kind of what you were saying before about uh, the beauty of doing these is that if you, do a, if you do a charity video for a charity and you do it the right way, which is for the charity and not for the dealership, keep your branding in there. At the very end, everybody throws you a thank you shout out. What ends up happening is they post that. That's their video. Part of what you gave them as a charity is the video. You talk about their concerns, why the charity is there. You really make the video for the charity, and then let them go distribute the video for you. Uh, it's kind of the same principle as a testimonial. If you hear from your church that Bill Pierre Ford just helped you do that, that's much better than hearing from anybody in part of the dealership. So these are actually some of the best videos, I think, to, uh, to have once you've sort of stepped into that space because you're really going to engage and have a lot of customers feel, for lack of a better word, sort of indebted to you because uh, you helped whatever charity they're involved in. Having some video issues here. Never trust video. In. We're out here in Bear Creek today for the first annual golf tournament benefiting Children's Home Society. Uh, out here having some fun and raising some money for the uh, foster care and uh, adoptive services and out-of-home care. And 
That's fun. So the last one is uh, viral videos. So the secret to internet videos is that uh, you never have to spend money to, 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 uh, to maintain or to broadcast them. Uh, that's never more true than it is with viral videos. Um, you know, the, the trick to viral videos is to see something engaging, something funny. Um, it's something that, uh, that will be shared, ideally. So I want to point out, even if you're trying to add a little bit of perception of value to your physical dealership, if you have somebody come put landscaping out front, you're still going to have to pay somebody to come back and trim the landscaping, to mow the grass. Video is literally the only effort that after you pay for the video, after you upload the video, it will cost you nothing, literally nothing. If you put ads on it, it might make you a few cents here and there. I got a $5 check from YouTube the other day. It was awesome. So nothing. And there's nothing else in the car business that's like that. There's nothing else really in business that's like that. And there's definitely nothing else in advertising that's like that. Uh, doing your own videos in-house and learning how to distribute them yourself is the solar panel equivalent or the, uh, the equivalent of a solar panel uh, in the advertising world. And I, I can't stress how important that really is. I mean, you, you compare doing an ad campaign, a $60,000 run in a newspaper, compared to spending $60,000 on a massive series of videos, that series is going to remain relevant, remain there, and remain free for three to five years before you really need to go back and change any of the major pieces on it. So if you divide that cost out monthly, it's, it, it's scary, the ROI on doing good video compared to pretty much every other type of advertising that eventually ends up in the trash or in some other format of trash. I'm going to take one more roll here out of our old video. Let's see if I can get this thing to play. So the, the trick to this is, this was a series that we had did for him that was actually a TV series. This is a special finance guy named the Credit Dom. So uh, this is supposed to be hokey. It's a play on the, on the Godfather. But so what happened is this, is, this is the full series. So he puts two 30-second versions out on TV and pays to distribute them. And he says, to see the full version, go to our website to see this. So this is an example of a viral video that's just goofy. And I hope, I hope the whole thing plays. But it got a ton of shares and it got a ton of play for him. But what it did is it got a lot of conversion. And the beauty of doing good video like this is that then you can do a regular radio spot or a regular direct mail piece. And you don't have to bring people all the way to the dealership to get them engaged in your process. You only have to get them to go to their, their own computer, sometimes their cell phone, and engage with your store right there on the internet. So that's a huge, huge, huge part of it. And, and he did a great job with this campaign of taking those. He had a huge presence on the internet already with this scheme. And we kind of turned it into a video uh, scheme. Uh, of taking some of that traffic and some of that brand name he had built on the radio and turn it into hits on his website and people buying cars. It's a very subtle way of doing a sale. I got your back. Don't worry about it. The Credit Dom says yes. Don't let financing stress you out. Come see me, The Credit Dom. Good credit, bad credit, we do it all. You just pick out the car and let me worry about the banks. <laughs> the Dom says yes, you're approved. I love my new car. I don't know how you did it. Thanks, Credit Dom. Bankruptcy, divorce, new in town, first time buyer. It doesn't matter. The Credit Dom can get it done for you. Hey, Tommy, show them where to go. Just do it. Uh, so, all right, so this is the good part. So Auto Trader, this is, how, this, is, this is really why I'm here. As I talked about in the beginning, we, a lot of dealers were really interested in video. They understood the principle behind it, but they weren't ready to write a check because it didn't drive sales that week. Uh, and Auto Trader, we kind of linked up with them, and this is really the, the solution that we have to that. This is how to take video, put it in front of people who are buying cars this week, right now, today. Hello, I'm Eddie Colley with AutoTrader.com. I'm the director of our dealer education team. So what a lot of dealers have done is they've allowed the internet to kind of just be this price warring battlefield. But we found in the old days it was all about the story. What did you bring to value to the consumer? Why would they want to do business with you? And the internet has really fundamentally changed that. Consumers now can compare cars side to side, but they can also compare dealers side by side. They want to hear about you, hear about why they should be coming to your store, and really what value you're adding to the car. They can find another car just like it anywhere. They just can't find another you. 
So one thing that we see is a huge opportunities for our viewers out there is really taking advantage of the videos. And we're not just talking the pan and scan videos where you're taking videos, uh, pictures, that you're just making them big and small, but actually real life video content that consumers can now experience. So an amazing thing to me, and I was a dealer for a lot of years, is how inexpensive it is to post videos and get them out there. In fact, on AutoTrader, a lot of the packages already include the videos. And the best part is the consumers are engaged in it, and we see our dealers that are engaged in video are getting just phenomenal results compared to those who don't. From autotrade.com, obviously we thank you for your business if you're one of our customers, but most importantly, autotrade.com provides a platform where dealers can actually compete side by side. And to win, you just have to do the basics. You have to provide consumers what they're looking for. At our company, we're framing it up as a transparent dealership, and through transparency, through video, and through pictures, and through comments, you can actually win. And on our site, there's a great opportunity for you to win, to win the consumer's business, not just for your front end, but also for your back end, your service parts, and everything. So autotrade.com is a wonderful place to sell your store and customers are there looking for those stories. So, uh, Auto Trader, this is the beauty of Auto Trader. Uh, literally every search starts the same way, and you're looking at it. Find your make, find your zip, and you punch it in. Uh, there's really not a lot of variation that goes into that process, and it's the same for every car, whether you paid for ads, whether you're a huge dealer, whether you, you're curbing a car, doesn't matter. If you have the car that's the criteria they're looking for, Auto Trader's bringing it back. So, now for the good part, how to use videos to cross line and kind of beat that one to the punch. So, Auto Trader with no videos. I don't know how well you guys can see this. So, basically, this one here has uh, 10 photos, this one here has 13 photos, and this one has 15 photos in one video. And that video is not a video, that's a slideshow. So that's what, that's what your average buyer is looking at. And now this is a search for a 2008 Ford Escape. So the customer doesn't care about you, they don't care about the next guy, and they don't care about the guy behind him, they care about a 2008 Ford Escape, and that's it. So I think most dealers would be mortified if they knew how often their cars, they don't get the click and they don't get the hit, they don't get the pass through, but how often their cars show up as one of these eight cars that are being searched for and, no, and just gets ignored. It'd make you sick. You're that close to the opportunity thousands more times than, you, than you'd like to, to address. Um, got another stat here. So roughly 60%, and think about this. This is 60% just sounds like a stat because it's just the internet. But these are our buyers. I mean, if, these were six, if these were 100 cars in a row, and I talked about what the first 60 cars were going to do, I'd have everybody's attention. 60% of first clicks go to either the cheapest vehicle shown or to the closest searcher. So you have two options, a mobile dealership or a dealership that doesn't make any money. If you're comfortable with those two, you can have all the business you want, or at least all the first clicks. So after that, it starts to become a dogfight. So this is Auto Trader with videos attached. This is actually the same page. I just scrolled down one. This is Bill Pierre Ford, our client. Four videos, one video that's a slideshow, 13 pictures, or 13 pictures, 10 pictures. So obviously, if the if only thing I care about is the 2008 Ford Escape, my mind is going to wander to four videos every time. Uh, you're you're going to find that if you're one of the few in your market, which like I said, in Seattle, we've pretty much gobbled up definitely every Ford dealer and most of the other ones. So if you don't have four videos in Seattle, you might as well not pay Auto Trader because you're not going to get any action. We have everybody that dialed in. Um, so not everybody, not yet. I don't know why. Um, but what the four videos do is it, it, it totally separates you from everybody else. Now you're going to steal 60% of the clicks. You're not going to have to pay someone to tell you how to give your cars away. You're not going to have to work as hard to get in front of people. And literally, your traffic will instantly double. The interest you get off AutoTrader, if you're the only one in your market doing it, call, I'll, pay, I'll send you 10 bucks if, you, if I'm a liar. Throw a good effort at it. It will instantly double. Now, if you convert that traffic, something we're about to talk about is on you. But the interest that you'll get and the amount of times people look at pictures of your cars will double if everyone else says zero or one video and you say four. Um, when we started doing this in Seattle, we're real, and I'll show you how to make these videos that are relative so that they actually key in on the cars people are searching for here in a moment. But when we first started doing this, there was a lot of other vendors that would see four from our first few clients and so they would rush and they would do four. But their four were two slideshows and a factory stolen commercial and something they put out eight years ago. So, they might get the click, but the internet is a real place. And at the end of that digital whatever is a real person. And if I'm looking for something and I go to four videos and they have nothing to do with anything, and I go to four videos that have everything to do with what I'm interested in, as a buyer, it's not hard to figure out that I'm either going to pay nothing for the car I wasn't impressed with or that somebody built a little bit of value in the process and I might actually pay for you know, all the money for the right car.
so this is what it looks like when you click through. Um, so what this is in their example, you're looking at a 2008 Ford Escape. So what you actually have from here is a, uh, I believe this is a, I, do a, I did a product series for them that year. This is last year. So this is actually the Ford Escape product series, uh, which matches uh, just the general idea of what an Escape is. And that's, that's kind of their go at it. This is a used car. So this is, it would be their We Detail video. So this would talk about, you know, if you're concerned with detail process, don't, you know, don't be da 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 da. Uh, it shows their process, shows their managers. Uh, the other one might be a testimonial from a customer who bought uh, a Ford Escape. But the trick to doing this is every one of those would be different. Uh, we also have like a video that's kind of a staple is we train. We have, and that's kind of a new car video. So if you look at a new car uh, at any one of these dealerships, you're going to get folks, we train our people. Our Hyundai certified salespeople are the best in the business. We go over, we, we work this many hours a day, da, da, da. If there's a question you have, we will know the answer. So really, the videos that go on there, and what's great about this is AutoTrader, you don't have to interact with to pull these videos. If you notice, the way they're presenting them, AutoTrader thinks those are VIN-specific videos. It doesn't, it doesn't realize that it's sorting them the way that you are sorting them. Where the magic happens is on your back-end tool, where when you're pricing that 2008 Ford Escape out, you're going out of my videos, what are the most relative videos for this particular product, and you're attaching them to that vehicle in your back-end tool. Google's just looking like it's on your side here. It thinks those are four walk-around series about that particular car. They think they're all been specific. Um, so that, that's kind of the key, and it just depends. If this was a hybrid vehicle, they have a We Know Hybrid video that says don't buy hybrid or green technologies from people who don't know how they work. You know, we have more in stock. We have people who know how to use them. Um, so basically, it's, it's you're, you're making the case that you'd want to make, and, and you have to look at who you are as a dealer. What do you sell? Uh, you know, if you're, if you're a Dodge dealer and, and Cummings Diesel is where you're making all your money, uh, you're going to want to do a We Know Trucks video. We carry more trucks. We have guys that know how trucks work. You know, don't buy, don't buy a 350 from somebody that doesn't know how it works. You know, We Know Trucks. Um, so really, it just depends on how big you want to step into the space. Most of the packages that we sell to dealers have about eight brand statements. We try to pick the best. If I owned a dealership, I'd probably have 18 maybe, which would just be broken down into different specific things. And you can only really show four at a time. And that's kind of the weird thing about video is that you might get just a great used car testimonial from somebody and go, ah, I'm just putting that on all my used cars. And you can be as smart as you can be with any other form of social media or any other form of advertising because you can just look at it from the terms of uh, what type of car is this? You know, this is a hatchback, kind of a family car. I'm going to throw that family testimonial on there. Or this is kind of a sports car. I'm going to throw the, the, the picture of the guy that bought the hot rod, that testimonial on there. I'm going to throw my wee detail video. The one video I didn't mention is since this is a, a used car, you'd always get your used car department video, and then your brand statements, and then you walk around. So and you only get four, and they all have to be under three minutes. I just found that out the other day. I had to do some re-editing. So um, this is a scary stat that I heard the other day. Um, so first impressions that you have the, when you have the opportunity in front of a customer, the first impression may literally going forward in the car business be the only impression uh, that you get the opportunity to make. Uh, and what I mean by that is, statistically speaking, the average buyer only visits one dealership in person. If you're a dealer principal, that should terrify you if you don't feel like you have your competition dominated online. Terrify you. That means that the 19-foot gorilla, the Starbucks machine, it's, it, none of it means anything anymore if they don't come in and see it. Um, scary stat. I like the back half, though. This is after visiting an average of six websites for cars after leaving the house. Six websites, one dealer. Which makes me you know, logically ask, what are they looking for? Why, why? Why go to six dealerships? And I think it's kind of the same reason why I wander around Best Buy. It's because I'm waiting for somebody that I want to buy from. Just like anything else, a salesperson is always the most, most important thing. People are waiting to be sold. I mean, if you guys are probably most of the ladies, are probably most of you guys salespeople. Salespeople are the easiest laydowns there are. I mean, if I'm sold on something, I'm sold. I, I'm, I'm, you know, everything but the, the, the protection pack. So I, I, think that, uh, I think that's an important thing to point out is that people want to be sold. They want to, hear, they want to get a good presentation, just like somebody wants a good anything, uh, any sales presentation. They want you to come out with a video, and they want you to make that case. They want you to ask for their business right there where they are. They just don't want to do it in a tacky way, and they don't want to sit through a six-minute video to get to the point. So what is the first impression you're sending to your prospects? It's just, and, and this is something I think a lot of people overlook. That question is just as important online as it is in the store. One-to-one. -one. Every bit is important. So now, think of every opportunity as being one-to-one. -one. You get 100 in your store, 
10,000 on your website, right? So it's kind of like 1,000 times more important than it is in the store. I mean, if you have 800 or 8,000 uh, pieces of traffic come through your website and you only set 45 appointments, it sounds like there's like 7,950 people that are telling you they didn't like your, their first impression of you online, right? I mean, those should all be seen just like people who drive off the lot. The goal, they say they look at six, uh, six sites. The goal is not to be the first one. And that's why I don't use video to do SEO. I don't think it's the point. They're going to look at six before they're satisfied either way. The goal is not to be the first ad somebody looks at. The goal is to be the last ad somebody looks at before they decide to buy a car. So uh, just quick math here. What is a better conversion of internet traffic worth than real money? I don't think a lot of people are really aware of this. This is just kind of my math. Bear with me. So what is an appointment worth is the only way to really break that down. So most dealers will tell you they keep about a $2,500 uh, per copy, front and back average. Some will lie and tell you it's more. but On a set appointment, confirmed, most dealers will tell you that they're somewhere between 50 to 60% closing ratio on a set appointment. Um, some will lie and tell you it's 80. So no matter how you look at it, roughly speaking, every single confirmed appointment, take the car deal, take the test drive, take the finance, the back-end money, the gap, take everything that makes sense out of it, Every single appointment's a $1,500 opportunity. That's huge. That's huge. Uh, you know, it's hard to get your salespeople to sell a phone, to, get, to sell a car, and get them motivated. When I was on the desk, our biggest thing was make calls. I get you motivated about setting an appointment all day. You can do that. You, only the finance guy sells cars. You can't exactly do that. But to, to get motivated about a $1,500 opportunity that is an appointment, and motivated by the pool of thousands of customers who are only cruising around looking for somebody to set that particular appointment with, it's motivating. So what is a better conversion of internet traffic worth? I'm going to use a sample dealership. 5,000 hits a month. If they see an increase in their conversion percentage, appointment conversion percentage, uh, appointment conversion percentage of 1%, not lofty goals, 1%, 100 people, one person made the difference. Or one person had the difference made for them. It might just be somebody who loves video. Or somebody who has a crush on the salesperson you saw in the video. Or who knows, 100 people, anything could happen, 1%. 1% increase in aversion literally equals 50 appointments. 50 appointments at the $1,500 per appointment is $75,000 a month. So I'm going to put that one back up there. 50 appointments and $1,500 a month is $75,000 in profit. That's not, that's not gross sales or anything else. That's profit in the pocket every single month. And not only that, that's not $75,000 for doing video or $75,000 for stepping into that video space or for capturing that market. That's $75,000 for, for sake of dramatic purpose, every additional 1%. If that 1% if that becomes 10%, that's $750,000 a month. The only problem you have then is not having enough cars out there because there's plenty of buyers. And they're on your site. They're visiting six, going to one. So I would like to make the case that this is where all your gross profit is at. This is why you came here. And this is where you want to play the game. And thus far, there's not very many people in the space. That's the good news. So video costs nothing to maintain. I kind of covered that on that before. I'm just going to hit a couple more bullets. Uh, you never, ever have to pay to broadcast. That's huge. I can't touch on that enough. Um, you, it doesn't make any sense to pay Comcast $15,000 and they're going to come do your commercial for free. And that sounds great. Uh, but the fact is that they don't come do your commercial for free. They pay somebody $700 to do your commercial and take it out of the deal that they put together with you on the broadcasting. The problem with that is now you're spending $14,300 distributing a $700 commercial. Doesn't make any sense. Uh, you could spend $14,300 on a commercial, $700 getting it out, getting the fire started, and the thing will go viral for three or four years. You never have to pay anybody else. Um, so it's just a different way of looking at it. Uh, but for me, I'd rather put my money into being creative and engaging with my customers and not in being all over the airspace with a $700 commercial that they've seen before. So builds value in your process. Um, everybody who's ever watched a training DVD has, has gotten to the part of the DVD where the, 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 the trainer brags about how he'll drag somebody back out of the booth and walk them around the building three more times and show them the service department. And it sounds funny, but it works. That is what we do. As salespeople, when somebody has an objection, we give them a better expectation of process. Uh, when I was training people in the SAFT event business, the biggest thing that I would train them on was this face right here. Five more minutes. Folks, five more minutes. That was all. Because if they knew how to get five more minutes out of somebody, they'd eventually bring us a write-up. 
And that was all we needed. Five more minutes, folks. I'm not asking you for anything. Five more minutes. But it's amazing how giving somebody an expectation of the process will lubricate the deal. And it works the exact same way online. Somebody wants to know, when you come in, this is how we do it. We pick out a car, we test drive it. When you come inside, you're going to sit down with Derek. Derek's our new car manager. Hi, I'm Derek. I haven't been in the business for five years. Okay, great. Derek's going to pencil the figures in this way. Here's a copy of what our presentation looks like. You're going to have an opportunity to make the offer whatever you want, but ultimately, folks, it's whatever number you think is fair. We won't lose your business over anything. It's the same thing you say in the store. Just saying it before they decide which store they want to go do it with. Um, lastly, I touched on this a little bit already, but enhanced perception of value. People only know what they tell them. Uh, a 19-foot gorilla does not mean you have a better finance office. The 19-foot gorilla does not mean you have better cars or nicer salespeople, but for some reason it seems to tell people that. So this is the 19-foot gorilla. So another thing I want to touch on, our motto that we started when we, did this when we first started this company was the quality of your videos directly, and this touches on the perception thing, uh, the quality of your videos directly reflect the quality of your brand or business. And that's important uh, to me for several reasons. I know a lot of people that have YouTube channels with 300 videos on it, with an average of 1.75 views per video. Uh, not to name names, I got in a huge argument with somebody most people here know the other day. Uh, he's trying to get me to produce thousands of videos for him. No, bro, I need thousands. I'm doing SEO. I need, to, I need thousands. I can't imagine what you'd ever need thousands of videos for. To me, thousands of videos tells me that somebody's going to waste my time. That's the first perception that I would get as a buyer. Um, what I'm looking for is somebody who's addressing what I want, what I'm after, and, and, and is doing it in a way that, that, that represents the quality that I would expect within their dealership. The same reason that you pick up popcorn from outside and change your trash, it's the same principle online. If you have a really, really terrible video, and I've seen, uh, there's a Lexus of Bellevue store that's uh, 20 minutes from my house. I think it's a $19 million building, and the only videos for the most part, other than like tier two stuff that they've done for themselves, that you can find are salespeople standing out there going like this. Tell me about it. Yeah, okay, and then they look down at their feet and stop it. That to me doesn't scream $19 million. If I owned that dealer and I was in charge of that situation, I would delete every single one of those videos. I'd rather somebody know only that I was a Lexus dealer than, than know me only through those videos. So at the end of the day, salespeople are just in the presentation business. I think it's important to, rec to, to realize that. Uh, when everyone was afraid that we were gonna go out of business due to true car, I, I wasn't afraid at all because I realized that the car business is never going out of business. It's just going online. It's just retreating from the lot and going into the, the digital space. But the good news that's there is that you can go with it using the exact same techniques you used on the lot. You don't have to learn everything else. You don't have, Pinterest, social media, that stuff is all great. It's all extremely useful. But you don't have to know any of that to know how to get up and give the exact same sort of rebuttal, same clothes, same brand messages that you would give to a customer if he was standing in front of you. It's the same thing we do every single day. And I think it's important to recognize that, that you're already in the presentation business and that your videos should make a clear, strong first impression and start building towards value towards a sale right away. Same thing when you send a car guy out, or I'm sorry, a, uh, a salesperson out there, if his tie's not done the right way, if, if, he's, if, he's, if he's got a hat on, if his sunglasses are on, you know, managers are flipping desks trying to beat them to the customer because they don't want to make a bad first impression. Everybody who pulls on the lot's worth a certain amount of money. This is the same thing. The goal is to, is to get somebody at that point when they're visiting around at dealerships, make that strong first impression and drive your brand home with them. Beep, beep, it's girly leap. So uh, I got the 10 minutes left here. I'm gonna go over quickly with you guys the, uh, the six rules to getting good footage. So these are huge. Um, the one that I didn't put on here that I can't stress enough is use a tripod. For God's sakes, use a tripod. There, you can literally, uh, I think actually the next promo video that we're going to do is I'm going to do an entire uh, video with a phone. Because you can literally do everything you need video quality wise. All the stuff you saw that we shot there was with that. That's not a fancy piece of equipment. Everything you need to do video wise can be done on a phone if you do it the right way. First things first, the right way is this way, just for the record. That's the difference between somebody who doesn't know anything about the internet to a customer who's savvy and somebody who does. Everything on the internet comes widescreen. That's what I'm getting at. If you hold a video like this, it's, it's up. It, it plays smaller in the window because the, the, you know, Facebook's fields are top to bottom. If you hold it wideways, you'll get a nice big video on the screen. If you hold it top ways, you get this little dinky video. So, and it just don't look right. So the first thing is use a tripod. Always have your phone widescreen. And you can literally use a cell phone to do 80% of the stuff that I have here. And this stuff is all on our website. 
So first, 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 first rule. Always shoot with your shadow. Now this isn't always, this, these are mainly rules for how to set up a good like, testimony, a good interview. I'm going to have you stand here, I stand here. This is just how to make it look cool. That's mainly what this is. But this rule is extremely important because a lot of making these videos, and you'll see, I didn't get a chance to really show you much of what we had done, uh, but it's B-roll. We call it B-roll. You know, while you're saying I had a nice experience, I'm watching you shake hands with the manager, that sort of thing. But when you're outside on the lot, uh, the first thing we do when we get to a job site is figure out where the sun's at. Uh, where's it coming up at? Where's it going down at? I know that sounds ridiculous, but and a lot of, I had a guy ask me actually at the last seal, he goes, why, why do you keep doing this? He, I guess he kept seeing me walk around with my hand up. But I stick my hand up straight in the air to see where my shadow falls. So if your shadow falls this way or that way, or you know, it's almost worse is right above you. That's why we live in Seattle. It's diffused lighting all day. It's perfect for video. Um, but if you do see your shadow, and let's say it's facing that way, when I have a camera and I'm walking around the lot looking for shots, I'm literally only looking that way. I don't even bother looking over my shoulder because it won't, it won't matter. If you shoot into the sun, everything behind what you're trying to shoot is brighter than what you're trying to shoot. So you'll get, no, you'll get nothing. Um, in fact, I probably have an example. I'm getting ahead of myself here. So that's what it looks like if you don't shoot with the sun. And it's not terrible, but that doesn't scream, doesn't scream quality at me. Um, you can see the sun's on the left side of your face, so you get nothing but shadow. And it's, that's not into the sun, but into the sun is even worse. Into the sun, you just get black with them. And you, I see it all the time. I, I love being in Vegas because people never stop taking pictures. And I'm, for whatever reason, pleased by watching people take pictures that will never, ever come out. I, and I love watching people stand in front of these big, bright windows and just get all upset about it. But it's never going to work. The very first thing you do when you're shooting testimonies is go, where does the flow of light come from? So if you're inside your dealership, look for the doors. Because the doors are strict, all the lights go through the door. So it means it's, it's coming this way. It's just like you'd want it to do, you know, right, right inside. If you get in the middle of the dealership, you start to get top down light and a bunch of other light. So what you really want to do is shoot in the morning, shoot in the evening, and shoot with your shadow. If you're shooting at a point where you've got at least the shadow that's as tall as you are, and you're shooting into it, you're going to get absolutely Hollywood looking lighting every single time for free and not spend a penny. And it's the easiest thing in the world. If you try to break that rule, you'll get this. And it's not, the, the, the always shoot with your shadow is more of a guide. It's not going to ruin a shot. You can, you can find spots on CSI and stuff like that where they don't have, you know, the perfect, the perfect light with the sun. It, it's not something that's going to blow your customers out, but it is definitely something to consider. So the second rule, and this is something that nobody does, is set up your background first. You can tell when this testimony was taken that somebody pulled up a car, asked this nice young lady to stand in front of it, and then just kind of set up. So the problem with doing that is that you don't have a very good background or a very good subject. Nothing is really done that well at all. And that's how about 99% of these go. So the trick is to set your background up first. Literally, what I'll do is take the camera and get the background that I like. Uh, another trick that, that I find people do too is you get short people taking pictures of tall people. And if the tall person walks towards them, they start to walk out of frame. So they're like confused by that. The height of the camera is a very, very important thing. If you're going to shoot somebody's face, the camera should be either six inches below or six inches above their face no more. If you're playing by those rules, I can make you come towards the camera, away from the camera, and all that matters is I'm just cropping you from here to here. But your face is still exactly where I wanted it to be the entire time. So the trick is you set the background up first. You decide what you want to be in the background, and you move the person into the shot so that they look the way that you want it to look. Believe me, it works. It's great. So when setting the background up, this is actually that same lot. When setting the background up, there's, I got two rules of thumb for you guys here that you make sure you always end up with a dynamic background. First things first, one of the things that really helps these testimonials stand out is you guys, I don't know if you can tell this, but you see how the, there's a sharp focus along him and everything else is just blurred out. It makes it way easier to A, hide stuff on a lot like cigarette butts and trash cans and just anything that's not perfect, but it also makes it look a lot more like it just has quality. Even on an iPhone, if the background is far enough away from the subject, you're going to get some of that blur. So the trick is to look for as much depth as possible behind the person. You want to look for straight lines. You guys ever remember in art class when you make the perspective drawings? You draw the horizon point, and then all the buildings are kind of like slant towards it until it looks like you're looking down a street. That's a cool effect, and it works. That's how, that's how your eye actually sees, sees the world. So the more straight lines, whether they're vertical or horizontal, I mean, literally just looking for elements of straight. Like if I was going to set up an interview here, this would be the first thing i look at. Because I got a little, it's going back a little bit. I got some nice straight lines. So when those lines get smaller in the background, it gives me a sense of scale. It makes it more appealing to look at that shot. So the, the, the fourth rule is look for colors and depths. 
Um, I, I've been known, especially when we're, we're dealing with a real camera and you can make the background blurry, to just kick a mop bucket <laughs> into the background. There you go, I got some yellow. It works. Um, for whatever reason, people aren't really paying that much attention. They just, and you guys, I don't know how well you can tell, but that's a, a vibrant blue car and a vibrant red one right there beside him. But uh, and you, you, know, you have greens in the background, some reds. So literally, that's how I'm breaking down a background. If, if I'm looking at the time of day that it's going to look good, and I'm looking for straight lines in the background, color, but more than anything, either a long way to go before the backdrop or sort of a cascading backdrop to where there's maybe something 10 feet behind, 20 feet behind, then 30 feet behind. Because the thing that's 30 feet behind will be more out of focus than the thing that's 10 feet behind. You see what I mean? It just gives it sort of a dynamic look. So this is the most important rule for creating your own footage. Follow the rule of thirds. Uh, most cameras, like these DSLR cameras and other ones, are going to have a, a function. You just hit info. And these, these guides right here will actually pop up. Um, and what it's doing is dividing your, your whole screen into thirds. And you'll notice this. You can go watch Hollywood movies. Um, this is an example of what not to do, by the way, this particular picture. But the rule of thirds is the rule for getting good shots. That's what the brain wants to see. For whatever reason, your eyes follow the, the, the left and right uh, third marks more than anything else in the top and bottom. So you really want to try to frame your subject into one of these top two right uh, uh, b buttons there. And what that'll do is it leaves you kind of a whole other story in this part of it that people, they don't have to watch the person talking. They can get bored and, you know, play internet creepo and stare around in the background because that's how people like to use the internet. You know, they don't like stuff that's right in their face. So it gives them a little bit of, little bit of space away from the person that you're talking to and it gives them something to look at in the background. Now let's say I wanted to look at her from here up or from here down. If I'm up and I'm in the right spot as far as eye level, all I gotta do is have her move back, move forward and adjust the focus. It's too easy. So here's another example, same exact shot, but just how to move forward. Now he's a little bit bigger in the frame and uh, just a little bit different looking shot. Here's another thing. I don't know if I have time for this. I've got two minutes here. The Volkswagen thing in the high. Volkswagen dealerships are impossible to shoot because all their signage has to be like 15 feet. Is it, is it actually mandated? I don't know if there's any Volkswagen dealerships. It's like 15 feet off the ground. So every time you ever see testimonials for Volkswagen, you're looking up their nose. Because <laughs> everybody just can't resist the temptation to try to get the Volkswagen thing in there. So for the record, that's how you do it, is you put it 35 feet behind you so that it's only this big. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be looking up their nose. There's no way around it. And there's another example of, uh, I guess, the right way to do it. Follow the rule of thirds. Uh, the last rule, hopefully I can get this video to play long enough. This is only 15 seconds. Uh, and this is really, really an important one. I'm hoping that this will just play. So what this is going to show, if it plays, is he's kind of out of focus right now. And you wouldn't know, I don't know how well you guys are going to be able to tell right there, that that's him bringing him back into focus. On these DSLRs, once you picked up a shot, you can actually, there's a plus button on the side. If you hit the plus button twice, you'll literally zoom all the way in. Now, that's what he was doing there. So that even though I'm looking at it like this, the camera's screen is very small, but the information is there. So it can digitally zoom, and I can look at just the tip of somebody's ear. And 90% of the time, if I'm looking at the frame, I have no idea whether it's in perfect focus or not until I do those extra two clicks in to get it just right. But when it goes online, that's what makes everybody think I have an $80,000 camera. Because they're like, whoa, because the focus looks great. But it comes from really taking that extra 30 seconds every time you set up a shot to do plus plus and, and hairpin the focus and make sure you have them absolutely dialed in. And it'll go, uh, it'll go a long, long way for you. All right, so that's all I have. If you guys have any questions about video, let me know. But get me before 8 o'clock. It's Vegas.